Last year, I had to adjust some of the insurance cover we had for one of our businesses and I needed to increase what we had and change what we had. So I started the long phone call with the broker, went through all the details and uh, proposed what I wanted and then worked out that I couldn't do what I wanted. But they said, you know, while you're here, you know, we can increase this professional indemnity and let's check your product insurance details. I said, yeah, sure. So they went through the details and they said, so what's the product? And I said, oh, you know, like uh, gifts and souvenirs. And they, and it, um, like small things. And they said, small goods. I said, small goods? Yes, small goods. And they said, no, small goods is not gifts and souvenirs. Small goods is deli meats and sausages. And I said, what? Sausages? <laughs> so it turns out that for five years, we had been insured as a sausage shop. <laughs> and as I'm on the phone to them, I quickly Googled small goods, like who came up with small goods to represent meat? It didn't make any sense to me, but that was the category that we were in. So then now I had to work out what category should we be in. That can go down now. And didn't bother about adding the new cover or anything like that. I just dealt with the current situation, which was a big pest because you just think all these years been paying that money for nothing as a sausage shop. And they said, yeah, like look at the paperwork, page seven. You scroll down, it says, yeah, it said, um, yeah, sausage shop or something. <laughs> Didn't read the paperwork. But it, it showed a weakness. That whole situation exposed the weakness that we had in our business. And fortunately, we were able to resolve it. Fortunately, the risk is probably minimal. However, still a weakness because if you want insurance, you want to make sure that you're not underinsured and you want to make sure you're in the right category because otherwise it's, you're paying it for nothing. It was frustrating. But it got me thinking about weakness and we all have a weakness or we all have weaknesses. Will anyone want to admit to having a weakness? Yeah? Surprise, surprise. Sometimes we want to hide them. Are you aware of any weaknesses? Are there, are there some more apparent to you than others? What, what might one be? What weakness might you be hiding? We can be weak towards food. I know at the moment I don't mind a good chocolate-coated licorice. And if they're in the cupboard, I'm weak towards it. I just get into it. Or we can have a skills lack, a limitation in a skill. I must admit, I can't back a trailer. We haven't owned trailers. And there was one time I was backing the trailer in and getting help from my significant other. And I felt like the directions I was getting was more like the, I uh, like to move it, move it dance or like some kind of Egyptian. I couldn't decipher the instructions. So I sped off in a huff around the corner and tried again. So I need to go to the way camp <laughs> and get Philip to train me in proper trailer backing. Some people can't bench as much as they want or run as fast as they want or run at all or get to the gym. Some people's weakness might be spending money or not spending money or lacking in confidence, or how, how might you perceive yourself? Do you see yourself as a strong person or a weak person? What about this question? Is there in your life an overarching weakness towards the Lord that goes beyond what you feel? How often are you aware that you need him? Is it every day or is it when things go wrong? Is it when things go right, 
When everything's falling into place, do you still say, Lord, I, I just need you? Or is it when we need something specific that he has our attention? I just want to dive into a text here. We're looking at 2 Corinthians where Paul is speaking about his weakness. You'll be familiar with it. And this particular church caused Paul a lot of grief. He was constantly dealing with something with this group of people. He had a lot of situations to sort out, but we're jumping in at 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. And he says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ. Then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul mentions the weakness that he had, a limitation in his body, which we tend to believe is his eyesight. He had weak eyesight. But it was something that the Lord wouldn't take away, that it was intended for his good, for his benefit. Reflect now back on your life again. There could be things that are in there that are not comfortable or you don't want, and yet it's the Lord's intent that they're there to draw you unto him. And so for Paul, his bad eyesight, but the purpose was that he wouldn't become conceited. And so it's the Lord's mercy to us to allow limitations and to encourage us to keep relying on him. I heard John Piper once say that he, he had this limitation where he couldn't read fast enough. He had to read slow. And he was so ashamed of that because as a Bible researcher and scholar, he couldn't read as much as his peers. And yet he found a place to say, you know what, Lord, no, this is for your benefit. As I read slow, give me more revelation. Give me more light. And so now for him, he enjoys reading slow. But he didn't see it like that at first. But notice that Paul did plead with the Lord to take it away three times. And I think we should take note that as we speak about weakness and we speak about sometimes having limitations in the body, we're not, we shouldn't assume that every sickness or infirmity is from the Lord. But like him, we seek healing. Like him, we seek deliverance. And if it is the Lord, he'll deal with us. But if it's not, we should be healed. We must seek deliverance and healing because we know from other scriptures, Psalm 103, Isaiah 53, 5, by his wounds we are healed. Remember the Lord and his benefits. He saves and he heals. So I just wanted to make that note for those that are wondering, well, I've got this thing and is it from God or is it not? You need to seek, but don't accept that every sickness is just from the Lord. In this situation with Paul, it was. We read on, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul's conclusion was that Christ's power rests on him when he's at the end of himself when he's empty of him, when he holds on to weakness instead of in his own eyes considering himself strong. It's not just when things go bad that, that, that we should consider ourselves weak, but somehow finding a place that every single day of our life we are weak 
towards him and we are weak to him and we are weak in our own eyes when we see ourselves. Surrendering to him, coming to the end of ourselves. And he actually had a lot of reasons to boast. He had reason to be proud of himself, but he chose not to. And he said, I will boast in my weakness. For he knew that boasting in his strengths is not Christ. It's not the way of Christ. Do you know, one out, do you know anyone that boasts in their weakness? It goes against our culture. It goes against the world that we live in. People want to boast about what they're good at. They want to try and make it look like they have it all together or making a name for themselves or finding joy in the wrong things and fighting for their rights and self-seeking and self-preserving. And there's a lot of self. There's a lot of wanting to be perceived a certain way and not being real. But the paradox of the Christian life is the complete opposite of the culture around us. The way, of the, Christ, the way of Christ is taking up our cross. and It's losing our life so that we find it. It's following him each day. It's self-denial. It's submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's the Beatitudes of Matthew 5. It's being poor in spirit. We read on. In verse 10, for the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, I am strong. So he goes on further from weaknesses, then, to cover off the things that can happen in our life. And we haven't had hardships like he's had hardships, flogged and weep, whipped and shipwrecks and in the sea overnight and in jail. and I mean, this man, you imagine if he took his shirt off, you're at the beach and you saw him, he would be covered in scars for all the beatings that he endured. He had reason to boast of what he had done, but he points us to the way of Christ. He suffered. And the Christian life is not a life without its hardships. I want to move on now to have a look at the life, some things that happened to Saul, King Saul. And let's go to the book of 1 Samuel now in chapter 15. Just to compare just some of the actions and attitudes we see here. So the Lord sends the prophet Saul and says, I want to send you on a mission. And I'm not going to go into details of the mission here, but check out David's Bible video on 1 Samuel chapter 15 to find out more. But basically, he takes an army of like 210,000 people to go and fight uh, another group. And the Lord gave him very specific instructions on what to do. And did he do it? No, he didn't. And instead of wiping out everything, they came back with all the good stuff. And 1 Samuel 15, 10 to 13 says that the word of the Lord came to Samuel, the prophet, I regret that I have made Saul king. Wow. For he has turned back from following me. If you had a highlighter or a way of underlining that in your Bible, I would do that. That leaps off the page at me because he turned back from following me. Every day, we have to follow him. We have to follow the Lord. It goes on, and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument to himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. So he went and he fought and he didn't obey the Lord and he came back and he praised himself for the success that they had 
but it was only the success that he thought he had because he disobeyed the Lord. And I found a photo of him from Facebook taking a, taking a selfie in front of his statue. 42,000 likes. Mount Carmel was a commercial city. And Saul knew that the the aristocrats and the cartoon, um, (laughs) the fancy people, if you wanted to impress anyone, if you wanted to be high class, that was the town. So, very humbly of himself, he set up a monument to himself. Which, remember, he turned back from following the Lord and he's, he's, he's focused on self. It reminds me of our culture. It reminds me of the, the things that we can struggle with every single day because the way of Christ is completely opposite. He fell into the temptation of preserving his own name and building a monument to himself. And I think that when we stop following the Lord, the danger becomes it becomes all about us. But it's, we can stop following him in little things. It's not just a, a renounce. It can be, I follow him in this, but not this. Or it could be sometimes the challenge of adding our faith in, so adding a bit of prayer or a, a bit of Bible reading, but not daily saying, I'm going to follow the Lord, whatever you want, whatever you do. We read on, 1 Samuel 15, 13 to 15, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be to you, the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. It's a lie. And Samuel said, What then is all this bleeding of sheep in my ears and lowing of oxen that I hear? You're meant to wipe out everything. They have brought them in from the Amalekites. For the people... For the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Notice that. And the rest we have devoted to to destruction. So interesting thing here is he blames the people. So this is the king that took the 200,000 people to war and he said it was the people that spared the best of the sheep and all that. It wasn't me. You're the king. You're the one in charge. And plus, we brought him back. You're the prophet. Let's have a sacrifice. And you should go and look at that because there, it has that reference, I think, from Isaiah. It talks about that the Lord doesn't want sacrifices. He wants obedience. But he didn't do what the Lord asked him, and he was blaming the people. And we go on. 1 Samuel 15, 24 to 26. Saul said to Samuel, so Samuel said, you, you, you've, you've gone against the Lord. You've sinned. And he said, I have sinned. I've transgressed the com- commandment of the Lord and your words. Why? You should underline this too. I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. Remember the Pharisees, they feared the people. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow down before the Lord. He's moving on pretty quick. There's not much repentance there. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Fired. You're done. Over. It's a a really heart-moving passage really when you look at like it's the title of it is Saul is rejected as king and when he was confronted he didn't take ownership of it he lied about it he minimized it he blamed the people and that's not the kind of king you want and he turned the winds that he went and did for the Lord to himself and reflect that now with another king King David who we know is a man after God's own heart, who when he sinned, gross sin, immoral, terrible. His words were, for I know my transgressions are ever before me. 
and to you only have I sinned. Psalm 51, awesome psalm to memorize. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit. So I think part of, part of looking at weakness today, we can't just look at, we can't ignore sometimes we have weaknesses in our flesh towards sin. However, when we say we boast in weakness, none of us should have to put up with a habitual sin for our whole life. There is victory available to all of us to totally conquer and overcome things that may hinder us. And you should go, if you didn't hear the messages that John spoke, um, we'll put a link in the message here. It was on sanctification. And one's called Getting Free, and the other one's called um, Holy Love and False Loves. Watch those messages about finding breakthrough from habitual sin and, and um, very practical, helpful messages. But when we're talking about weakness, we're not talking about just struggling with weakness towards sin. You can be set free. What I want to try and get at today is having that overarching awareness of your need of him. Start thinking about Christ now. I want to go back to Corinthians. There's probably more we can say about David and compare Saul and David, but... 2 Corinthians 13, 4, for he was crucified in weakness, but lives by the power of God. The Lord, the King of kings, leaving his glory, having legions of angels at his disposal, being the one who's the supreme power and authority over all things, he came lowly. You know, when he was pinned to that cross, he could have lashed out and killed all those dudes. Easy. That would be the easy thing for him to do. However, the hard thing that he did in example to us was saying, not my will, but your will be done. The hard thing that he did was the one that had the supreme authority, sweat blood, thinking about having to go through the cross. Jesus born in a manger, Jesus friend of sinners, Jesus the one who came to serve, Jesus riding a donkey, Jesus the one who washed the feet like a servant, submitted his will. He took on the humiliation, the beatings, he took on the shame, the curse of the cross, This is Jesus who didn't even see equality with God, something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. And so the real strength that he shows as an example to us was his surrender. And he invites you to do the same. I'm reminded of the reference in Revelation where it says, you've been made a kingdom and priests. We talked about two kings, but that's talking about a kingdom. But for each of us, every day, I think there's the invitation of the Lord to to follow him and continually find Find that security in being a weak person. And I think it leads us to be open and real with the people around us. I think it means that if there is something that you struggle with day after day, that you you take ownership of that sin and face it to find deliverance. I think it's being okay with not having to be a professional Christian. 
You see, Saul is all about the external. And when the Lord rejected him, the Lord said, See, Samuel, go to the house of Jesse. I have reserved a king for myself. You know who that was, David. I think today is meant to be a reminder that we don't have to be professional. It's not about the external. It's about us. Whether things are going good or bad, we're always weak towards the Lord. We always need his strength. It's like that song, every hour I need you. Every hour. I know what it's like. I know sometimes it's easier when things are wrong, going wrong, where you need something, that that's when you seek more. But when things are going good, it's a challenge. However, some of us have reason to boast. Whatever reason you might have and nothing. We need to boast in him, what he has done, what he will do.